Hey guys, so today we're going to be talking about the ACT science section and how I was able to improve my science score from a 19 to a 34. So science is actually one section that many students have a very hard time with when they start studying for the ACT, when they start prepping. Like I did, I started out getting a 19 on the ACT science section. But with a lot of practice and with strategy development and some skill development as well, which we'll discuss in this video, you can improve your science score by a lot. And my experience with doing that is what I'm going to be talking about in this video. So I'll outline what exactly this video is going to look like. I'll start out by giving you guys a few advanced strategies that I use in that process of improving my science score, not just the regular strategies of, you know, skimming and, you know, that kind of stuff, but some really in-depth, advanced, and easy to use things that you can start doing right now to start getting that improvement that you're looking for. Then I'll show you how you can apply those strategies to actual passages and see those strategies in action to, you know, get an idea of what the actual application of those strategies is going to be for you and how it was for me. And that'll help you get a better idea of the best way that you can use those strategies to get your improvement. Lastly, I'll go over some common ACT science question types that show up a lot on the ACT science exam and that if you master and look out for, you'll be giving your score a huge boost because these are very common question types on all ACT science exams for this coming year. Before we get into the video, make sure that you subscribe and hit the notification bell below so that next time we make an ACT strategy prep or review video, you get notified. So before we get into the strategies and the actual content, I'll give you guys a basic introduction into the ACT science section. So the ACT science section tests you on your ability to read, analyze, and report information uh, presented to you in the form of scientific graphs, figures, tables, um, just scientific passages in general. So you have to read this information, analyze it, extrapolate it, manipulate it, and then report it through these questions that they're gonna ask you. You're gonna have 40 questions you have to answer in 35 minutes, and there's gonna be about six or seven passages on any ACT science exam. Moving on to strategies. So the first strategy is to skim and skim as fast as possible. So we've heard this before that skimming can really help on the ACT reading section, as well as the ACT science section, because you have a huge time crunch and you have a lot of content that you need to get through and read and analyze and answer questions about. So there's a huge time crunch on the science section. So skimming really helps, but I'm not just gonna tell you to skim because you know that's a, that's a kind of a well-known tip that everyone uses already. There's more that you can do more than just skimming. You might even be wondering, what does that word skimming even mean? So when I think of skimming, I think of the term passage glancing. That's the way I define skimming. So if you have a passage, right, and you have all this content that you need to read through, instead of going through and reading everything in depth, just look at all of the components of the passage. Look at the tables, look at the graphs, look at the text that you're provided with. And don't try to interpret and understand all of the little details, just look at it. And what this allows you to do is two things. First, you're not interpreting all those details that you don't need because there's a lot of details that are in the passage that are not going to be asked about in the questions. You don't need to know every single detail in the passage to answer those questions. So just get a basic understanding and move on. And the second thing that that glancing action allows you to do is get some understanding of what's going on. Glancing also helps you get a better understanding of the passage's organization and where the main ideas and main relationships and variables are located. So if you glance over the passage and you skim over it quickly and you focus on the right areas to glance over, then you'll be getting the perfect amount of understanding, spending not too much time getting that understanding and giving yourself plenty of time to answer those questions. So when you're doing this passage glancing thing, just look over the main parts of the passage. Look over the graphs, tables, and the text. Now what exactly should you be looking for when you're doing this passage glancing thing? That's what our next two tips are about. So the first thing that you're going to have to do when you're glancing through these passages is you have to pick up relationships and variables in the passages. Now, as we said, you could just read all these passages in depth, but in order to get the fastest understanding of the science texts, just analyze and take note of relationships and variables that you see in those passages and how those variables are related. So when you see a line graph, for example, instead of trying to understand everything that's going on with the line graph and how it works, just take note of the X and Y axis labels so you know what the units are and move on from there. That's the basic general understanding of that figure that you need so that if you're asked about those two variables and how they're related, you know which figure to refer to. So again, just focus on getting a quick understanding of the relationships and variables in passages. And this usually comes from just taking note of those variables within their respective figures. The second thing you have to do when passage glancing is if you're provided with multiple experiments, trials, or figures within the same passage, you must find differences between different passage elements. So what does this mean? Let's say that you're given a passage that has different experiments that are being done. It says, you know, there's, this is experiment one, this is experiment two, this is experiment three. Well, you're going to be asked about what are the similarities and differences between those experiments because they're not all going to be the same. They're all going to have certain variables or relationships that are a bit different. 
So you need to take note of those differences because they will be asked about. If we look at the last ACT practice exam that was released by the ACT writers, the 2018-2019 version, 10 out of the 40 questions were directly testing on differences between different passage elements. So you can see that doing this is very, very important to answering a large chunk of these questions correctly. So when you're skimming, when you're passage glancing, remember relationships and variables. And the second thing you need to look out for is differences between passage elements. We'll discuss some examples of these and how you can look for them in the next part of the video. All right, now we're gonna discuss the three main ACT science passage types, as well as demonstrate how you can use these strategies that we just discussed for the three passage types individually because they are a bit different and your approach for each of them is going to have to be a little bit different as well. Let's start by discussing the three passage types. So the first one is data representation. This is the most simple of the three and you're just simply given one or two tables or figures and you have to analyze that data and simply answer questions about it. There's nothing too complicated here. Just remember that data representation passages are characterized by the fact that you're given data from only one experiment or one observation. And this is important because the next passage type, which is research summaries, is just about the exact same, except in research summaries, you're given more than one experiment or study within the same passage. So this means that in research summaries, you'll have a passage that has different experiments that are similar that are being done within the same passage and relating to the same topic. And this is where that finding differences strategy really, really comes in. You're going to use the same rules of skimming, but in research summaries passages, since there are different experiments that are similar but not the same, you're absolutely, absolutely going to be asked about the differences between those experiments and what those differences mean. So again, when you're skimming through these passages, take note of those differences because they will be asked about. And usually those differences just come in the form of a different independent variable or a different dependent variable. And we'll discuss what this means when we go through an actual research summaries passage. The last passage type is conflicting viewpoints. In conflicting viewpoints passages, you're given different viewpoints about a certain scientific topic. Each of these viewpoints will be at least a little bit different, and you're going to have to read through these viewpoints and find the similarities and differences and answer questions about those things. So again, it's all about reading in depth and finding those differences. And I actually do not recommend that you skim for conflicting viewpoints passages because getting an in-depth understanding of what each opinion is saying is very, very important. And there isn't too much text. You can read through it fairly quickly and still have time to answer your questions. But the strategy of finding differences is extremely important here, more so than any other passage type. All right, now what we're gonna do is go through each of these passages in real time and demonstrate how to use these strategies. So we'll start with this passage that we have here. This is a data representation passage and we'll just skim through it and get that basic understanding as quickly as possible. So if you just skim the little passage at the top of the page, you can pick up some keywords such as uh, concentration of methane, uh, talks about Earth's surface over the last certain number of years, solar radiation intensity. So it's talking about all of these things and basically you get the idea that over a certain number of years, you have this figure that demonstrates concentration of this gas methane in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, it also talks about solar radiation intensity over this time period, and that's all that figure one is. So if we look at figure one, we want to get an understanding of it just based on the figure itself. If we look at the units, we have years at the bottom, radiation intensity on the left, and concentration of methane on the right, and each of them has their own graph that you can see from the key that's right there. And then figure two, it says that it's about the exact same type of graph just over a shorter period of time. So again, we see the same exact units, intensity on the left, concentration on the right, and years on the bottom, and we have our graphs there too. So it just took about a minute, and we have a basic understanding of what this passage is saying. You can see how we took note of the units that the figures are talking about, and from there we derived that Okay, there's some sort of relationship between years and these two dependent variables of concentration and intensity. So with data representation, it's pretty simple. Just get the basic gist of the passage at the top, if there is one. And when you look at the figures, look at units, take note of those, and try to extrapolate any relationship that you see while you are reading. Just get the general understanding of how that specific figure contributes to the passage and the passage's meaning. So the next passage type we'll demonstrate is a research summaries passage. So in this one right off the bat, you can see that there's various experiments within the same passage itself. So there's experiments one, two, and three. 
and they're all going to be a little bit different. So we're going to make sure we take note of those differences when we're reading. So if you read the little description on the top, just glance through it, you'll maybe pick up some things about what an acid base indicator is, uh, what a transition range is and how it relates to that. It also talks about the pH values that are being used and how the well plates are being used in the experiment. Not super critical information, but it's good to just look at it and take note of it and remember where it is. Now in experiment one, if we just skim through it, we get different values that it's talking about. It talks about the actual process and how they're looking for these output colors, B, G, O, P, R, and Y, uh, based on these different indicators that they are using as inputs. And they're using pH values of one through seven. So that's experiment one. Okay, now let's move on to looking at experiments two and three and see if they are any different or how they are different. So experiment two says right off the bat, experiment one was repeated with solutions that had a pH of eight or higher. So that explicitly tells you the difference between two and one. Don't need to worry about finding any other differences. Uh, you don't actually have to look at the results because it's the exact same type of table. Uh, you don't need to know what the results themselves are until you're asked about them through any of the questions. So again, as long as you have the basic understanding of what the table is trying to say and what its significance is in the passage, then you're fine. You don't need any more understanding. So in experiment three, it's kind of the same thing, except you just don't know the pH values. So these colors, these solutions, one, two, three, and four, kind of match up with one of these columns, zero through 14. We just don't know which one it would be because the pH value has to be from zero to 14. And the passage is just saying, we don't know what it is. So that's the basic understanding you need of this passage. Experiment one is the base experiment. You have pH one through seven. Experiment two is the same thing with pH eight or greater. And experiment three is the third variation where you do not know the pH. So that's all the understanding you need. We know the inputs, we know the outputs. We know that the inputs are these different indicators. We know the outputs are the color values that we're getting. Uh, the pH also can be considered an input. So if you have an understanding of those main general things, then you're fine to go on and answer the questions. So our last passage type is the conflicting viewpoints passage. So in this one, you can see it's a lot of text and we have these three hypotheses that we have to read through and find differences between to answer the questions. So let's just start by skimming through the first part of the passage, the top paragraph. So it tells us about these butterflies that uh, migrate to Mexico where they stay for the winter. Um, they accumulate lipids or fats to use as energy later. The hypotheses are just about how exactly or when exactly these butterflies um, store their lipids and for what use. So hypothesis one, let's go and read what it's about. Uh, they require energy from stored lipids for migration during the overwintering period. First stored lipids at the beginning. During migration, they use those lipids and their mass continuously decreases. Uh, then they reach the overwintering sites and the migration and store lipids again. So that's hypothesis one. And we'll use that as the base hypothesis for the next two. We'll just look for anything that's different than that. So hypothesis two starts out the exact same. Uh, but then it says, but not during the overwintering period. So that's immediately right off the bat, one difference that we can take note of. Then it talks about the butterfly store lipids before they begin their migration. That's a similarity between the first and the second. During migration, as store lipids are converted to energy, lipid mass decreases. That's a similarity because energy from store lipids is not required during the overwintering period. The butterflies do not store lipids while at the sites. So the main difference between one and two is what happens at the sites, what happens at the very end, once the butterflies reach the overwintering sites. Hypothesis one says that they restore lipids and get more. And hypothesis two says that they don't need them while they're at the overwintering sites, so they do not get more. Now let's go on to hypothesis three because we have cleared up the differences between one and two. Monarch butterflies require energy from stored lipids, but not for migration. So that's the main difference between three and two and one. Then it says the butterflies do not store lipids before they begin. So that's another difference. Instead, lipids are stored during migration as the migration happens. Uh, lipid mass continues to increases from the beginning. The butterflies arrive and they have enough to go through the overwintering period. So they need lipids over the overwintering period. So they do not store lipids while at the overwintering sites. So that's a completely different hypothesis from two and one. Two just had one difference between one, but three is completely flipped. So that's the one that has the most differences between the others. So that's really all you have to do for the last passage type. Just take note of differences. Don't focus on getting the most in-depth understanding of what they're trying to say, because a lot of the times in these conflicting viewpoints passages, the information is going to be really advanced and it's not testing you on understanding. It's testing you on your ability to analyze what they're saying and extrapolate information. Usually that information you have to extrapolate is differences or similarities between their viewpoints. That's all it is. So that's it for the three main passage types. Now what we'll do is go through some common question types 
to get you a better understanding of the kind of questions you can expect on test day and what to look for. The first and most common question on the 2019-2020 ACT science exam is going to be that related to finding differences between one thing and another. I've already talked about this a lot and it shows up a lot on these science exams. I'm not going to elaborate any further because I've talked about it too much so far, but just find differences, as many differences as you can between different passage elements whenever you have to. So that means research summaries passages and conflicting viewpoints passages. Take note of differences because they are your best friend to answering these questions correctly. And again, like I said, up to 25% of these questions will likely be finding differences between one thing and another, one passage element or another, one table, one graph, one experiment, and another. So watch out for differences because you will be asked about them. As for the rest of the question types, now in the past, there were more different question type patterns and question type forms that you could take note of and see. But in this coming 2019-2020 ACT exam, it seems as if most of the other questions are just basic content extrapolation, manipulation, and analysis. It's just basic understanding of the graphs. And the only way to improve that skill, that understanding, is by practicing. So there's really nothing else you can do other than using these strategies besides practicing. So make sure you take a lot of practice tests. There are some linked in the description below, but those are your best friend when it comes to answering these details questions correctly because the rest of the questions are basically just testing you on details, different aspects of the passage, things that you have to go back and look up while you're answering questions. The more familiar you'll become with the kind of analysis that they're asking you to do, perhaps predicting some information based on a trend, for example, or doing something else like that. And the more you practice it, the better you'll get at it. So that's all we have for today, guys. Thank you for watching through the whole video. If you want to see more ACT prep content like this, just check out the rest of our videos on our channel, as well as the links below it. From our website, we have free practice exams, a free ACT skills study guide, and a lot more stuff there on our website for you guys to check out. If you want to see me solve through 15 really, really hard ACT math problems, click the link in the description below. And again, there's more helpful prep content like that on our website. Apart from that, guys, I'll see you guys in next week's video. Good luck on your exams and peace.